Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth of the four writing and submitting your NNLM proposals for Region 1 grants webinar series. We're delighted to have you. I'm Nancy Patterson, and I'm joined by Tony Gwen, our Executive Director of Region 1, and we hope these this series is helpful to you. Today's is called Show, because it's all about evaluation and reporting. Next slide, please. We will cover some evaluation. We're mostly focused on reporting. Um, we're gonna go into the nitty gritty of the data that's collected in reports and talk about wrapping it up. Once you've taken all the steps we've covered thus far, you're gonna wrap it up into a beautiful package like we have here. Uh, we're gonna talk about carrying it forward. That's the impact that your project has even after it's completed. And we will have time for some questions and answers too, but please feel free to either unmute or put questions in the chat box as we go too. And we will we will uh, aspire to pay attention. If we miss something, please feel free to <laughs> unmute and tap us on the shoulder. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide is really just to remind you that everything we're covering uh, in all four of these uh, webinars is covered in the NNLM Proposal Writing Toolkit. We've updated it recently, and it should be a really fantastic resource for you as you write a, a proposal specific to NNLM and, and specifically, um, well, NNLM as opposed to other organizations. Next slide, please. So one thing we've said throughout the series is you want to build evaluation in from the start. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But you, you do have to report at the end of the project. So if you are one of the people that we fund, one of the organizations, I should say, um, there will be reporting. And reporting is easier <laughs> if you've captured the information along the way. You don't have to have a panic and say, oh, no, how do I figure out who, who came to that session or how many people used this resource? Um, or how effective our impact was. So building it in as you go, you will easily be able to turn in reports on time. That's better for you, that's better for us, uh, makes everything run smoother. Um, and these are just some resources that we covered. So please don't forget about the NEC, it's the National Evaluation Center. Uh, a lot of resources there for doing community assessments, for working with logic models, um, for creating an evaluation plan and ways to collect, analyze information and act on it. So don't forget that as a resource. Next slide, please. So you're at the beginning of your process and you're at the beginning of ideas and building your project. We understand this. Um, so it feels a little, you know, jumping five steps forward to think ahead about how you're going to capture information. But I promise you, it makes everything easier if you take the time to do that, even though it, it feels a little odd at the very beginning. But once you have your plan, make sure that you look at it and see, have I built in here how I'm going to record the numbers? Now, that's an easy report uh, indicator uh, and one that's required for almost any funding, of course. So how many events, how many attendees, if you're doing social media stuff, how many retweets or likes or whatever, or the usage of a particular resource or center or, or what have you, whatever was created out of your project, um, how will you capture those as you go? That's an easier thing to do. We give you some templates for the reporting to do that. But also think about how you're going to tell some success stories. You know, what if you're at an event that you're holding and you, you have somebody come up and tell you how fantastic something was or how it's changed their life or it helped their aunt or whatever, do you have a mechanism in place to, to jot that down? Or have you reminded all, all of the people working on your project about the importance of capturing that kind of thing? Lessons learned uh, is one of one of the hardest things we get out of people because I think there's a belief that if you had problems, we we will think you did a bad job. Here's the news alert: everybody has problems. <laughs> there's going to be a hurdle. There's going to be a revision in some way, and we want to know that. So it's not a penalty at all. Um, in fact, it's very very helpful for us to share, for you to share, but for us to share with other people or for us to revamp our processes if need be, if that's if that would be helpful. So even stumbling blocks, you know, lessons learned in any way, but also the hard way, please share them. But think about how you're gonna capture that. Maybe you'll keep a journal that's the project journal and you're gonna take notes or compile notes from, from everybody working on the project to keep in this journal where you jot down things like that. Another thing is, as you go, 
could your project be replicated? Could somebody copy exactly what you've done easily and use it in a different community? Um, if so, something to think about as you go is, if I record my procedures or if I record these steps, maybe this can end up being an out of the box model for somebody else to use. And when we're reading proposals, when there's impact that goes beyond the project period like that, that counts for a lot. So is, do you have a mechanism in place to capture that or even to assess it? Uh, another aspects that, that we hope that you'll look at is, you know, where can you share your experience so that you're inspiring or educating other people, other people or other organizations doing the kind of similar work? Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And after the project ends, how will it continue? When we're looking at a bunch of different proposals and they're competing, if one project ends and that's it, and another project has a resource that's been developed or a model that's been developed or something that lives beyond the project year, there's potentially a little more weight on that project. Um, so these are all things to keep in mind as you go. How will you capture this kind of information? Next slide, please. So for reporting, we we are we make it pretty easy, I think, honestly. Uh, <laughs> so we make it easier uh, than a lot of uh, organizations. T Tony, <laughs> I know it's a lot of data, but um, there's basically four different types of reports. Um, a technology report, I'm going to take the one on the far right first, is only applicable if you have some technology as part of the funded project. So if you've received uh, some computer equipment or technological equipment, um, there's a technology report that needs to be done. And that's a report that just tells us, uh, you know, what you made of the use of that technology at your first outreach activity where you implemented it. Um, you know, was it what you thought it would be? Was it actually helpful? Oh, could it have been better? Was there something that you realized, you know, would have helped in a better way, a different, different equipment or something? Um, activity reports are the most reports you're going to submit. Um, so an activity report is a report for every outreach activity you conduct, every outreach event. Now, your award might be for one health fair, in which case you've got one activity report because you've just got an annual health fair. But if you have classes that you're doing or uh, some series of webinars or a series of community meetings, et cetera, each one is going to be an activity report. And those are submitted within the month that they are conducted, hopefully, um, you know, and or as soon as possible after that. <laughs> we're, we're pretty reasonable to work with, we understand but ideally within the month where they're conducted. And that's gonna be the, how many people attended, um, how, how did you, how are you assessing how the event went? Um, are you tweaking anything for next time? Um, if there is a next time and things about demographic information that are spelled out by NNLM that Tony's gonna to cover later. The mid and final reports are exactly what they sound like, a mid project year report and a final project year report. So mid-year isn't necessarily mid between May 1st and April 30th because sometimes the project start dates are delayed um, or somebody doesn't even apply. We have a rolling funding and they don't even apply till January. So the mid-year will not always be the same for all of the projects, but it's basically, uh, it's more free form in a way, but there's a template on, the, um, on a guide that we've provided. Um, basically just want to know what the progress is thus far. How's it going? You know, are you, are you on track? What have, have you met any stumbling blocks? Have you had to revise in any way? Um, and, and this is where it's nice to share things like success stories that you know thus far, that kind of thing. The final reports are more comprehensive. It's the same kind of information as the mid-year, but it's just covering the entire year. And hopefully you have a lot more information to share by that point too. Um, so more success stories or more or more obstacles you encountered that, that we should know about. Um, but those are the reports. The mid is due middle of the project year. The final report is due at the end of May. So your project ends April 30th um, or by April 30th, I should say, some end earlier. Um, but you have until the end of May to submit your final report. Feel free to send it early, we always say. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. 
And uh, so I think I covered the due dates already, the technology reports after the first use of the technology in an outreach activity, the activity reports in the month, at the end of the month that the, the activity is conducted, the mid-project reports are the midpoint of the project, depending on when you start, and the final project reports are due at the end of May. Next slide, please. And this is just a reminder, we talked in a previous webinar about drafting a project timeline and how helpful that is for critical thinking in terms of plotting everything out, starting at the end and, and moving backwards. Um, make sure that you've built in the reporting into your project timeline. Maybe you want to build in something specific in terms of uh, collecting specific data that you're, you're hoping to collect uh, for yourselves, but make sure it's built in. And this is just a reminder that it's as critical as the other parts of the project timeline to, to make sure those things are inserted. Next slide, please. And I think we are on to Tony now. So my section is the super fun area of... <laughs> As you're planning your project, think about the data that we may be asking you to report on. So if you're thinking about the data, you can see, put it into your proposal. Basically, this is the, the group that we will be focused on. This is the topic area that we will focus on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna share with you a lot of the different data that the National Library of Medicine looks for when we have to report back to them. And in doing so, you get an idea of what are we looking for when we're also looking at applications as well. So the first one that we'll look at are some of the data that's collected within an activity report. I know that it may look overwhelming as I start sharing these, but you know, you may just focus on something smaller and that is perfectly acceptable, especially based on the amount that you may be awarded. So don't fret too much, but I wanna share all of this information so that you know in advance and you can think, who am I going to be servicing when I do this outreach project? What kind of topics will I be covering? And um, what do I think will be done when I work with this population as well. So the first thing that we'll think about are what are the different activities that you may be interested in doing? Nancy had mentioned a health fair as one particular option, and that's under our awareness and promotion section. Um, she had also mentioned providing classes or workshops. Um, there might be a symposia that you might be uh, offering, and it may benefit not just your university, but it may be extended like even further out to say the state or the whole region, for instance. That would fall under career development and training. You may also be looking to um, enhance a program that you may be offering. So you may have to do focus groups, for instance, and that would be related to our user engagement and partnerships, all of which are incredibly helpful for both you and for us as well. NLM, the National Library of Medicine, does like to look at, are you going to be covering or discussing a particular product that they offer? And um, so those are things that we also want to consider. Are you integrating an NLM resource into your proposal? Most commonly known are PubMed, Medline Plus for consumer health, and then clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but there are any number of different NLM resources that are out there. I think in the NLM database of databases, I think there's probably around 150 that you can actually choose from. So this is a small selection of things that you may be thinking about as you're working with a particular audience. And we may also be considering like, are you, going to focus on a specific content piece. Um, it could be data management. Um, you may be focusing on data science, perhaps digital literacy, because if you're working with uh, uh, older adults who might have arthritis in their hand and they might not have used technology, if they're in a far reaching area that doesn't use technology necessarily in their normal work, this might be a first time experience for them to utilize computers to access health information. You might just be focused on health literacy, for instance, as a project. Um, you might also be thinking about things related to uh, substance misuse. So any number of different topics could be considered. 
Um, what are the organizations you're thinking of working with? And here you'll see that we've um, listed the academic institutions, the different libraries that you could co coordinate with, um, any number of different organizations you could be working with. Um, there could be government agencies, other associations, uh, hospitals, um, any other type of group that you might be thinking about. Those are things that you would want to share with us as well. And then what are the demographics of the group that you're thinking of working with? Are you going to focus on children and teens, maybe adults, perhaps seniors? Um, then there are the sexual and gender minorities. Are you looking for um, to do outreach to help with women's health, maternal health, for instance? Um, there could be LGBTQIA plus health that you're interested and focused on. Um, what is the geographic area that you're, uh, that you're hoping to connect with? Rural populations, urban populations, suburban? It could be based on where you are located as well. Um, medically underserved populations are highly looked at, I will say, by NIH. Um, are there particular issues and interests that you are want to want to focus on? And we've listed what they've asked us to record at the moment, and they could add more down the line too. So at the moment, these are the um, seven that they are kind of interested in. Um, and then what are the direct roles of the activities participants? So if you are hosting a class, who do you hope to market to and hope that uh, will benefit from the class directly, not indirectly? I know that if you teach a class to librarians, they might take the class and share that with um, students or um, health professionals, for instance. Um, if you're hosting a health fair, in general, the public will be in attendance for this, for example. So think about who you will have direct content, contact with for any particular activity um, that you offer. And then you'll start to think about what are the goals for each of the activities that you're offering. And the goals can vary over each different uh, uh, time frame. So if we look at the different timelines, and you might be in phase one, you might be looking at um, uh, community building as one of your activities or just awareness of resources. And then later for phase two, or if you have a phase three, you're looking at knowledge and skill development. You could also be looking at developing trust throughout this whole process and utilizing NLM resources might be near the end. So that's kind of what it is that you'll focus on in terms of thinking about as you're building your timeline, what are the goals of each activity that you intend to have? So that's just for activities. Now, Nancy had also mentioned the mid and the final report. The good news is it's the same exact information. So you can build off of the mid report to help finish the final report easily. Um, so don't get discouraged if you see both a mid and a final report, because if you write all of the information in Word and save it, you can go back to it and it could easily be something you copy and paste into our website later on. OK. Um, so the first thing that you're going to talk about when you complete your mid or your final report are the approaches and the interventions used. The good news is we provide you some guiding questions. You do not have to answer every single question if you don't think it applies to you, okay, in your specific project. So um, this, these are just some questions that you could utilize to help with your project. You can also look back at your proposal if you're looking at the approaches that you had proposed and say, we've made some changes to our initial approach. Here are the steps and actions that we took instead based on the new knowledge that we gained as we investigated this project, okay? And the same thing happens. We understand that there, are, there may be some barriers that 
you encounter, someone that you may have um, worked with as a partner before, um, you believe that they would be a partner for this particular project, they may have changed. Um, it could be that some staff that you've listed, they found jobs elsewhere, which is very common these days. And so you have some delays in your timeline. Um, you have some un unanticipated budgetary issues, something that you got a quote for, say, now, the price has increased in May, which is very common these days. So those are things that you also have to keep in mind. So you can share those and we totally understand. It's a very common thing where there are some issues that may arise as you're working on your project. And then here again, you'll talk about the evaluation of your specific project. You'll talk about how you evaluated the project, what were the results that you had achieved, um, and you look at your objectives and respond to those. Did we meet that objective? Did we not? Again, you'll talk about some of those particular issues as to why or why not you may not have been able to obtain those objectives. And then one of the things that we do love to hear is how are you going to continue this project? In general, we don't want to see the same project over and over and over again from the same organization. So we, we would like to see how you plan to expand, to change, replicate, adapt, um, move the project forward to something even more. Um, I know that our funds are a little low. Uh, I consider them to be starter funds for future projects down the line that you intend to offer your communities. And again, Nancy had mentioned this before, but what are the lessons that you learned, both good and bad? You know, it's always good to celebrate the successes of things, but there are also things to keep in mind when you start proposing future projects down the line. Um, what were those particular lessons that you learned? In sharing that, other people who may read these reports may say, oh, that's a good tip. I'll keep that in mind if I'm going to offer that in my own community too. So that's something that I want to make sure that you share. And then lastly, aside from the other, like any other things that you'd like to share, um, the impact. And again, as Nancy mentioned, we love hearing success stories of someone who probably approached you following a class or they wrote in an evaluation something that you can take as a snippet that you can share. So sharing the impact of your project really looks wonderful in many people's eyes, okay? And let me share this back to Nancy. Okay, thank you. Um, so we talked about uh, impact moving beyond your project. Next slide, please. Uh, and I talked about you know how it can move further, where you can take it, uh, and that the specifics of that are where can you present? Um, is there a professional association or a, a group of community organizations that get together? Um, is there something locally, regionally, even nationally where you might be able to present about your project? Um, this not only gives you a little resume bullet uh, and your organization some exposure, it also highlights whatever the disparity is that you were trying to combat in your project. And I think the biggest thing to me is inspires other people to see that it's possible to, to achieve and to make some positive change. Um, so presenting at conferences mainly, I mean, that's a great thing. You can also do a little talk at a health fair or things like that as well. Where can you publish? Now, publishing isn't interesting to everyone, but it is to some people. And there are journals out there that are very interested in health information outreach. Um, or could you publish something in a local paper, even just a human interest story? You know, get it out there, take it further. Who can you inspire? Who's doing similar work to you or who would like to? If you know of groups or even individuals, just sharing with them your experience could take, you know, it could have impact on other communities that you didn't even build into your own proposal, but is taking it further. Um, and the same question, you know, the same group would apply to who might replicate it. Who could you share your model with if you created a model? Um, now, if you created a model, that's what your presentation and your publication is all about, right? Um, and how can you draw attention to disparities? There are all sorts of 
uh, social media and uh, papers, I, I was going to say uh, newspapers, but really it can be gazettes, it can be all sorts of things um, that are interested in these human interest stories or stories that help you improve a community. Um, so think about where you can do that and what resources can you share? Obviously, if you have a model, you're sharing that, but maybe you, uh, you know, you, you want to take Medline Plus further. I mean, that's something you can just post on a, on a professional uh, listserv. I see Buann has her hand up and we have a question in the chat as well. Uh, Buann, why don't you go ahead? So I have a question in regards to that. Would that include... If somebody, uh, if reporters wanted to reach out to you to do documentaries on the work that you're doing, would that include that as well? Oh, of course. Yes, okay. absolutely. I mean, that that's like the big time. No, that's great. <laughs> okay, great. All right, thank you. That would be great. We we had, uh, there's a really good documentary um, called Heroin, but it's uh, it's got the E at the end uh, in parentheses because it's about the heroin uh, epidemic across West Virginia and this one community that, that that made a huge difference, um, that were amazing. Um, but anyway, yes, there's lots of things like that and that would be incredible. So how, and I'm sorry if I'm asking two questions. That's no, okay. How, how would I go about, so I'm, I'm recently, a documentary that I talked about the work that I'm doing regarding like um, maternal health and, and stillborns is coming out October 17th, but I'm doing another one come out November. Mm -hmm. I mean, that will be shooting in November. How could I incorporate that in my proposal? Like I'm working with reporters in regards to getting out the work that we're doing. Absolutely. You know, all of these, these things are, you know, partners really, I mean, they're, you're, that's going to result in a separate thing of a documentary, but they're carrying it further. Um, but you can absolutely mention it. If you have a finished product, that's something we can look at and that would have more impact, but certainly the mention of it. And if you have any way of linking to any information about it, that's something that we can uh, factor in and would enjoy reading about. You can certainly okay. include that information in the uh, promotion section as well mentioning that you've done documentaries and things right, like that right. on your work. If you include that in your proposal, I would probably put it in the promotion section because it is getting, a goal of that would be to gain more uh, access to the, the work that you're doing on that particular topic. And I have, a, I have a question for me that said, are activity reports included in our proposal or submitted once we are awarded funding? The activity reports are after you're awarded funding and you've begun your project. So the activities are the outreach events that you wrote into your proposal, but you don't have to write in uh, anything specific to activity reports um, and certainly not report ahead of time, I think I might have confused uh, with the statement that you build in the ideas ahead of time. So if you know, for example, if your proposal is to do two health fairs in a year, um, build in that you're going to have uh, time to hand out participant information forms or however you're going to do it, whether it's paper forms or electronic. Um, whether you're going to keep a journal maybe uh, to record success stories. Those are all things that that really help us know that you're thinking ahead. But the activity reports themselves, no, you don't do until you've begun your project. You're already funded. And as you do each outreach event, you will do an activity report. Um, okay. And I, I think uh, the last thing I was saying was just you might have a resource that you want to promote, like um, Medline Plus. You you get so happy with how your community responded to it, you start posting that all over the place, your social media or your uh, listservs or what have you, but just thinking of ways of spreading the word. Uh, next slide, please. And along the same lines, I mentioned these a little bit, but basically, you know, think about all the avenues of communication you have and all of the contacts you have and the network of people that you're involved with and spread the word. So this could include social media, um, announcements to your community or communities wide that you're affiliated with, um, institutional news. So you might share something internally depending, um, professional association conferences, com professional and community listservs. Those are really impactful in terms of people are hungry for information there. And I get a lot of response when I, when I was more active in this way 
on professional listservs, my goodness, the response is great. Um, write an article for publication. If you're not being sought out by some big publication, look at your you know, local gazette or even a local regional paper that's a little bigger. And people are hungry for stories, especially good news stories about people making a difference in their communities. Um, webinars, you can do webinars on your own. Uh, actually, everybody can use Zoom now, right? <laughs> So um, you do a series of webinars on it. Um, do a webinar for us, actually. We, we love it. You're always welcome to present for us. So, uh, and I can talk to you more about that, anybody who's interested, but just think about the network of communication you have and spread the word. Um, that's the main message there. Um, I think the next slide, Tony, is, is the end, but I know you might want to do something else. Um, yeah. But before we get to the end, let me just say that I reiterate, Tony and I are here. At the very end, we'll show our, our slide with our emails and calendars for, for meeting with you, but we're here to help with the process. We know that these webinars are hopefully helpful, but you'll get into something specific and have a very uh, specific question that, that you want to ask. We're here for you, and we'd love to talk with you about your projects. And also with spreading the word, we also have our own blog as oh, well. Oh, yes, you can so write for our blog. You right? can write for our blog. You can also do a webinar to share your project. So um, think about those as additional things that you can do to help with um, after your project is completed, for instance. So um, we've gone over the proposal writing toolkit numerous times, as well as the evaluation resources. The one thing that um, is a little odd may be our applications um, process itself. Um, so we gave you some templates that you could use. I strongly encourage and recommend that you write everything out in like a Word document. That way you can save it all. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is our application system does not like tables at all. So try to avoid doing tables as you're writing your proposal uh, for us. So you'll see here that I went under to say, I'm not signed in here, for instance, but you can go under funding and look at available now. And you'll see a whole slew of different uh, applications that are available through the NNLM. It does vary by the state that you are in. So double check the state that you may be in. Um, you might select the region that you're looking for. And then also I choose open to see the awards that are open currently at this time. So you'll see here that there are the three applications that are available. Um, so for instance, you can go into Health Information Outreach Award, and you'll see here the online application overview and also the system requirements. So to apply for an app for us, you do have to have an, be an NNLM member, and you have to have uh, your own account as well. And your account has to be tied to the NNLM membership. So an NNLM member could be any institution, academic, library, whatever. Um, but you also have to have an NNLM account that is tied to that member record. If you do not have your account tied to a member record, you cannot apply on behalf of that organization. So just make sure that it is all tied together because that'll save you a lot of time. Yeah, but I can help of, you with that. Yeah, <laughs> Nancy could, I couldn't. I don't know the system well <laughs> enough to do that, but Nancy could do that. Um, another thing that I do like to point out is that you now need, instead of a DUNS number, you now need a unique entity ID number. And so if you work at an institution, your sponsored programs office should be able to tell you what your UEID is or UEI number. Um, but if you are at a community-based organization, you will have to apply for one if you do not have one yet. So make sure that you get that information um, as soon as possible. Um, and your sponsored programs office, if you are at an academic institution, should be able to help you out with that. So um, if you look here, you'll see that there is no application. Uh, you cannot apply in this particular section, and that is because I am not signed in. 
Okay. But if I sign in, so you'll see that I've signed into my account here, you'll see here now you have the option to apply for this grant. Um, if you are at an academic institution, check with your sponsored programs office and say, do you want me to apply or does the sp sponsored programs office need to apply and submit everything themselves? If they say that, they need to create an account and have it tied to, their, to the institution, and then they would need to upload and process everything in the system. So if you click on apply for this grant, and I'm not sure how long it's going to take Nancy. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed. Ooh, that was fast. It was kind of fast. <laughs> you will see that the information, because I am signed in, pre-populates a lot of this information. And I think I have like three institutions tied to me personally right now. But thanks, Nancy, for doing that, because I would never have been able to figure out how to do that either. But you would select your own institution and fill out this information. And again, it is the UEI number that our organization needs now, not the DUNS. Um, it's just that some other uh, regional medical libraries request the DUNS number, even though it's no longer federally required. But um, if your institution has a number of different people tied to that, it could be a, another person that you have that you select. It does not have to be you, for instance. Um, so if your sponsored programs office is the one that has to submit the application, if you are also tied to this, um, and I'll choose uh, Sun Yao, for instance, you could select that person. Um, if you don't see that name there, they can create a new project lead in here as well, and you'll have the fields to enter that information in. If you have organizations that have already confirmed collaborating with you, you can put that information in here as well. You'll put in, um, and this is when copy and paste really helps you out in all honesty, because you can just copy and paste like your project title, your project summary, when you plan to work on your project and when you hope it'll end. Um, if there's training that's going to be a part of the project. And sometimes there's no training that'll be part of a project. So if you're offering a health fair, for instance, I wouldn't call it formal training at all. If you are doing focus groups, for instance, it's not really training. You'll just do focus groups as your activity reports though. So that is something to keep in mind. They'll wanna see the evidence of need here as well. Um, we'll also want to see what the goals and objectives are, your implementation, schedule, timeline, evaluation plan, publicity and promotion, um, continuity of the project, your personnel qualifications. Okay. And then they, they asked for the total budget earlier, but they now want to see what the breakdown is. And then you'll share a brief budget justification. And if you went back to the proposal writing toolkit, you'll see how we did a, a breakdown of a budget justification. Um, we also shared earlier that um, there are budget spreadsheets that you could utilize that are found in the proposal writing toolkit. So um, I strongly encourage that as well. And how I mentioned the demographics earlier, these are again going to show up here. So that's something that you, if you've already thought about and consider that, just clicking the right buttons are going to be really easy. If you are asking someone else to fill out this information, please make sure that you've informed them what they'll have to click on. Because if you hand it to a sponsored programs person, they're not going to know, really, because they're probably copying and pasting into the application. They don't know that your project is related to adults, adult women um, who are in the rural areas and medically underserved, for instance, or you're focused on maternal health. So just make sure that you let them know under these sections, here's what I would like you to click. All right. Now, when you upload attachments, you'll want to include all of your CVs or resumes, any um, letters of support, we talked about that in a previous um, uh, session, as well as your budget information. So combine it all into one document, and it could be a PDF, 
uh, but it's easier to just do one single PDF unless you know that when you combined it, it's over 40 megabytes. If that is the case, you know, you have the ability to upload up to three documents. So make it worthwhile. Okay. And then um, all you have to do is click yes because you're acknowledging. Oh, and by the way, if you have additional up, uh, attachments, just click this button and you'll see another option to upload again. Okay. But you'll have to acknowledge all of this information and then submit. All right. And so um, you should, or the person who submits the application, they should receive a confirmation email that your application was successfully submitted. If you do not receive that, please contact us as soon as possible. And I know that the deadline was listed as November 5th at 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. Eastern time. We won't see the email until Monday. So just keep that in mind that um, the earlier you submit and you don't get the email confirmation, you know, we'll reply by the next business day. So if you feel the that it needs is, to be done uh, Thursday. November, sorry to interrupt, but the deadline is November 4th. Oh, it's the Friday. Before yeah, just not to, don't want to trap anybody. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. It's the, the end of the week. <laughs> close of business for us. And if you email us or call us after that deadline period, we might not pick up the phone or email until the very next business day, which is Monday. Okay. So just putting that out there into the open that um, the application is um, one of those things to that can be a little tedious. So writing things out in Word and you saw what the, the topics and everything were, it should help you out as you work on your application itself, okay? And then let's go back and you can review our past presentations if you would like. Um, if you go to our um, funding webinar series here, you can see the, um, well, this one is, the one you're at right now, but you can go to previous classes. And if you saw or recall something from say the last session, you can just click on that. Um, you should be able to uh, download the presentation as well as the handout if you would like. And then you can watch the webinar again if you'd like as well. Um, and I added the presentation and handout for this particular session and um, it is, 508 compliant, the version that's up there, which is no easy feat to do when you have all those tables that I shared, by the way. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you are aware that for parts one through three, the recordings, the presentation and handouts are available. And for this session, the presentation and handout is available so that you can download that already. Um, are there any additional questions? Oh, and you can also email us afterwards or schedule a meeting with us. Um, and you can do that at any point and we'll try and help out as best as possible. Um, so any questions and I can stop sharing as well. Lou Ann, do you still have a question for us? No, did I not put my hand down? No, but that's fine. I'm you, sorry. You could just be very eager, and that She's is perfectly friendly. Acceptable. She's waving. She's waving. That could be true, too. <laughs> um, any questions? Thank you for the grace. I'm taking it down. So we'll give it um, a minute for any particular questions. And, and we're available ongoing. So if something occurs to you, we are here. I do have a question. Is there a way to put a link in the chat to access the, the webinars again? I just did. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry, thank That's you. That's okay. That'll take you to all four and you can go to each one to get the handouts and the power or presentations, recordings. That's what I was trying to say. 
the the recording for this one might be about 24 to 48 hours so please give us a little bit of time to get that posted you're welcome any other questions And you are welcome, Samuel, for your proposal. Um, uh, one thing to point out, uh, both Nancy and I are not going to serve as peer reviewers for this process. So if you'd like to share what you're working on or writing at any point, you should feel free to reach out to us and we can give you some pointers. Um, the only thing that Nancy and I will do is look at the final scores and based on the top scores, from the proposals received, um, we'll be making our decisions from there, okay? Um, it'd be fantastic and awkward for us if everyone scored 100 points, <laughs> but um, we want to make sure that everyone writes a successful proposal at least. So it just makes the decision harder for us. Um, it's sad to see someone score low, and so we want to make sure everyone writes the best proposal possible. And I've already looked at like three proposals for other projects. So, and hopefully some of the suggestions help them. Well, seeing that there are no questions, I am happy to stop recording. Yeah, and and we're here if you come up with any. And thank you all for attending. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you again for the webinar. Thanks for attending. <laughs>